In this video, we're gonna focus in on one specific type of force that you're gonna learn how to calculate here, and that force is friction. Friction is everywhere, uh, and we can actually calculate it with a pretty simple relationship, so we're gonna talk about that right now. If you're gonna describe friction in a free body diagram, you're gonna use, uh, in this class, the, the symbol FF, the force of friction. Uh, something to note about friction to be very careful about is friction is always going to oppose motion or the attempted motion. So I could be pushing on uh, a block that's on my table and have it not actually move, but there's still friction there. It's just opposing the direction that I'm trying to make it move. Um, so friction is always going to act against you. Um, so that helps you know which direction it's going. If you're gonna describe friction, just a general definition that we're gonna to use to operate with here right now, is that friction is going to be the force that is opposing. So again, it's always acting opposite the motion. Uh, so it's opposing the motion between two objects that are in contact. Now, uh, this idea of objects in contact is gonna be really important because it helps us get a conceptual model of what friction actually is. So there are two types of friction. Um, we have static friction and we have dynamic or kinetic friction. Um, static friction is the friction of an object uh, when it is not moving. It's easy to look at two surfaces that are pretty smooth and say, those surfaces are smooth, like there's nothing that's pushing against them. But as you know, like friction has some sort of resistance to it, even if you're rubbing your hands together. And the reason for that is that even very smooth objects have some sort of microscopic texture to them. So I wanna model this here with an egg carton. Imagine that this is your microscope view of the table, something that looks pretty smooth to the naked eye. Now, on the microscopic level, there are a bunch of grooves here that are acting. If you have another surface um, that also has these microscopic features to them, and it settles in on that table, those grooves kind of find a natural place to rest. Now, if this is an object that's just sitting there, it's not moving. It isn't going to experience static friction that you have to overcome in order to get these two to start sliding apart from each other because they've had a chance to settle in, kind of find their, find their groove, if you will. So if we're gonna describe this idea of static friction, between two objects that are not moving, it's helpful for us to look and think about this on a microscopic level. It is friction where these objects have had a chance to kind of interlock. Now, once you overcome that static friction, you have dynamic friction. It's an objects that are sliding up, um, across each other. These surfaces don't have time, uh, the ability to really settle into those grooves anymore. Um, so our static friction, our kinetic friction is friction that is in motion. This is always going to be less than the static friction. Static friction is always greater than the dynamic because it's harder to overcome those locked in positions before it starts to slide. Uh, it is useful to see this in a simulation. All right, here I have a simulation of someone pulling an object across the table. Uh, and as with anything that you're trying to pull, you need to pull with a certain amount of force before it starts to move. So if I start the simulation and I plot the force, I'm pulling harder and harder and harder until finally it starts moving. And notice what happened once it started moving in this graph. We had to pull harder and harder and harder to get it to move. But once it started moving, this force dropped down dramatically. This is representing the static friction and this is representing the, the kinetic friction, that dynamic friction. So again, you have to pull harder and harder and harder, but once it starts moving, uh, that friction drops down suddenly. We can see that same graph here, um, and you can see kind of why it was happening. It's nice to see that simulation first. So as you're pulling, uh, the box at rest, the static of friction will apply whatever force you're pulling with until finally you overcome it and then get it moving. It's the same reason that if you're trying to move some heavy furniture, once you get it moving, you wanna keep sliding it because once it stops, it's gonna be harder to start moving again. So this friction will decrease once the motion starts. 
Now we can calculate this force of friction with a really simple relationship. Um, we say that the force of friction is equal to this symbol mu times r. We've seen this symbol r before. In the last video, we defined that as a normal reaction force. It is how much the surface is pushing back on an object, uh, which kind of makes sense. If you think, uh, think about it, that that's going to be a factor. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Mu here, uh, this is a Greek symbol, uh, is representing the coefficient of friction. And in math, coefficients are just numbers, just multipliers out in front of some other variable. So this coefficient of friction is actually unitless. There is no special unit to it. It's just a multiplier of the force, which means the two different features here that control how much friction is acting on an object is how much the surface is pushing. Think of that as how much you are squeezing those surfaces together. The harder you squeeze them together, the harder it is going to be to pull them across from each other. And this coefficient of friction. Coefficient of friction changes depending on the materials that you're talking about. So uh, steel on ice has a pretty low coefficient of friction, but climbing boots on rock have a pretty high coefficient of friction, something that you wouldn't want to slip with. Um, it is important that you can conceptually describe this. Uh, a large mu, a large coefficient of friction, is what you think of as quote unquote sticky. So it's surfaces that don't want to go past each other. Whereas a small mu, small coefficient of friction is slippery. So surfaces that slide very easily. And notice here in this table, uh, the coefficient of static friction is always higher than the coefficient of dynamic friction. Uh, and again, that is because static friction to overcome something that isn't moving always requires more. But the static friction has a little bit more to it as well. It can be a variety of different things. Dynamic friction is fixed. Once an object is moving, that is the amount of friction that it has. No matter how fast you are going, dynamic friction is a set value. But static friction, if I push on a block and it doesn't move, the, the friction is going to push back on me exactly the same amount that I am pushing on it. If I push harder, but it still doesn't move, it's just pushing back harder. So that static friction has a varying amount just to counteract what I am pushing uh, with it still not moving. Of course, as you saw, once it starts going, it becomes a lot easier to move, but here it will push back on whatever amount you are pushing. So this mu is times static friction uh, coefficient times r, we'll calculate this limit, but it can be any amount below that. And we see that in our data booklet um, we actually see two equations for friction that show up. Um, and the one for static friction, instead of having it as an equality, it says that the, the friction force is either equal to or less than um, this coefficient times r. Uh, and that's just because it will push back with however much force you are pushing on it until it finally starts moving. Um, so in general, honestly, you can think of this relationship uh, it doesn't matter if you're using static or dynamic, just use the one that the, the situation requires. So if it's moving or not moving. So just know that it's mu coefficient of friction times r. Interesting transition. Uh, so how do we calculate friction? Given a scenario, let's imagine that we're pulling a block here. Um, we'll just call it force of F. That is our external force. So that would probably be given to you. You say, all right, I've pulled with 20 newtons of force. This is a force that I know. Um, then we know some other forces that are acting. We then know that the force of gravity is pulling down. Gravity, we know we can calculate mass times gravity, mg, where g is neg or 9.81 meters per second squared. Now r, in this case, is counteracting gravity because it's on a flat surface. Um, and we know if we're sliding an object across the table that um, R and FG have to cancel each other out because the object is not accelerating off the table. It's not accelerating into the table. So R, we're just going to say is equal and opposite to FG. Um, again, asterisk here when this surface is flat. When we talk, talk about ramps here in a little bit, uh, we will not be necessarily assuming this. Um, R will just counteract a different force. Now, our last force here is the force of friction. If we're pulling this block over here to the right, um, then 
the force of friction is counteracting that motion, pulling to the left. Uh, we know that we can calculate coefficient of friction as long as we know R. Um, so coefficient of friction, uh, or F, F friction is just mu times R. Um, so that helps us know kind of what we've got. So the interesting thing about this is all of these steps are pretty easy, pretty small equations, but they're chained together. So in order to find the force of friction, you need to know R. In, in order to know R, you need to know Fg. In order to know Fg, you need to know the mass. So all of these different things are dependent upon earlier small equations. So let's look at an example here. Let's say that we have Santa's sleigh that's loaded up with toys for all the good little girls and boys until it has a mass of 2,000 kilograms. What is the static friction force that must be overcome to make this happen? Um, if it has a mass of 2,000 kilograms, we know it has a weight. We can find that weight. Mass times gravity is 2,000 times 9.81 or 19,620 newtons. We know that the ground must be pushing back up on it. And since this uh, Santa sleigh is going to just try to move uh, to the side, we know that R has to be counteracting the force of gravity. Uh, so R is just equal to that, which is, again, 19,620. If we know R, we can calculate what static friction um, would have to be to be overcome. Um, mu s is provided here. That's based on the surface of the sleigh uh, as it reacts with the, the, the snow beneath it. Um, so 0.1 times whatever R is, 19,620, will give us a force of friction of 1,962. That means the reindeer could pull with 500 newtons, sleigh wouldn't budge. Pull with 1,000 newtons, the sleigh wouldn't budge. You can pull with 1,961 newtons and the sleigh wouldn't budge. As soon as it exceeds that um, threshold, then it will start to move. So in general, that's a weird transition. In general here, uh, these are the, the steps that you're going to need. Uh, to find um, acceleration, then if we're going to have an object that is starting to move, uh, you need to first find the force of friction. Remember, to find the force of friction, you need R. To have R, you probably need to know the force of gravity. To know the force of gravity, you need to know the mass. Once you have all of these forces, you're going to use your understanding of net force to figure out how these cancel. So R and Fg in these scenarios will typically cancel. And then the push or external force will somehow cancel out with your force of friction um, to give you a net force. And then once you know the net force and you know the mass, you can find the acceleration using Newton's second law, F equals ma. So let's plug in those variables here uh, and say that our sleigh has started to move. So again, we got a sleigh that's 2,000 kilograms. Um, so we want to know how fast it's going to accelerate if the reindeer are now pulling with 4,980 newtons of force. Um, so this F pull we are given is 4,980 newtons. Um, since we have a mass, we have force of gravity, we have a weight. Uh, that's calculated the same thing that we did before. Uh, 2,000 times 9.81 is equal to 19,620. I'll plug that in down here. Um, we know that this uh, sleigh, in this case, is just going to be pulled horizontally. So that means there's no force uh, net force going up or going down. So these verticals have to cancel each other out. So R has to be equal and opposite to FG, which again is 19,620. And that leaves us now with a force of friction. Force of friction has to counteract the motion. And we assume that we're moving in the direction that the reindeer are pulling. Um, and in this case, we're saying that the sleigh is accelerating. So there must be a net force. Force of friction probably isn't going to be as much as the force of the pole, but we can calculate exactly what it is because we know the coefficient of kinetic friction, which is 0 0.05, and we know R. Um, so 0 0.05 times that 19,620 gives us a force of friction of what 9, 981 newtons. So if you think back to what we were doing a couple videos ago, if I gave you a free body diagram that looked like this, you should have plenty to tell me what the net force is. These 19,620, they are equal and opposite. They cancel each other out. 
So all I'm left with to find the net force is just taking the difference between these two. And that gives me 3,999 newtons. If I know the net force and I know the mass, I can find the acceleration because F equals MA. So rearranging A is just equal to F divided by M. The net force is for almost 4,000 here divided by 2,000 kilograms gives me an acceleration of about 2 meters per second squared. Whew. So like I said, there's lots of steps here, but all of the steps individually are super easy. You just need to know how to go from one step to the next. So general takeaways, you should be able to calculate the coefficient or the force of friction if you're given the reaction force and the coefficient. You should be able to quantitatively compare these surfaces, know like what do you have to do in order to increase the friction. And uh, you should be able to calculate the acceleration of an object based on some external force and a mass and using all of those little equations to figure out a net force and ultimately an acceleration.